Oh, I'm. Uh, I worked for AT and T for 40, 40 years. Right. Uh, now I, I quote unquote retired from there in uh, just after Sandy, Sandy in, in March of twenty thirteen. Um, I was in research at 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 and T at Bell Labs. Uh, did a variety of stuff there in research. Uh, and but I worked I worked meteorology into what I was doing there. You know, most of it was not dedicated to meteorology, but I always uh, worked worked it into what I was doing there into telecommunications, you know, the hazards to telecommunication network, uh, right. et cetera. And uh, and uh, that that uh, and after I quote unquote retired in March of 2013, then I I teamed up with uh, people at Rutgers, and uh, because it was right after Sandy, that's why I got involved in studying Sandy. And oh, okay. uh, I've been working with Dave Robinson. I think a lot of you know know Dave. Did you know Dave uh, DeBoer? He worked at AT and T. I I think I met him at one of the meetings many years ago. I haven't, you know, because I live an hour away from here. Got another name. Benjamin I have a cousin, meetings, Michael but... Russo. I think he used to work at Bell Labs in uh, Jersey. Okay, uh, yeah, don't you don't know his name, but, but another fellow that worked for at and was uh, Ken Connisser. Oh, Ken, Ken, yes. Yeah, Ken Connisser. Sure, that thought, you okay. know Ken Connisser. Where's this picture? Maybe you don't. Oh, my backyard. <laughs> oh. <laughs> was it really? That's, yeah, that's my oh, backyard. Oh, my God. I see more pictures of it. Where? Do we have about an hour? Is that how long? Give or take. As long as you want. As long as you want. No, the library closes at 9. It closes at 9. Okay, you got the... What town? What town do you live in? See, okay? Yeah, no, I just was trying to get the glare off. Okay, so, yeah, it's a bridge water. So Which one? anyway, with that brief introduction of what I've done, I, okay. So I've been, since then I've been doing research on mainly on Sandy, on various aspects of Sandy. Uh, so um, Dave, Dave Robinson is one of my colleagues on this work, uh, and some some of you may know Matt Jerbish. He's mm -hmm. also at Rutgers. Um, Kung Gao is uh, from no, it's GFDL, uh, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab at uh, Princeton, and he's. He's a true roll vortex expert, which I'll be talking about later. Uh, Pete Johnson is with Cray Supercomputers in, uh, mm -hmm. in Minneapolis. Whoop. Too fast. Don't use that. <laughs> uh, so most of us lived through the impacts of Sandy. We're definitely familiar with them. The devastating storm surge uh, flooding, the extended power outages caused by the massive tree fall. Uh, one thing I forgot about when I was putting this together a year ago or so, that tw there were 20 deaths caused by fallen tree, 20 wow. direct deaths by fallen trees. I had kind of slipped by the wayside, as far as my memory went. The tree fall, as we already touched on, was widespread, but it was very patchy, very patchy tree fall. Why was it so patchy? We hypothesized that the patchiness was called, uh, caused by roll vortices, and we'll, we'll be talking about mm -hmm. this. Uh, uh, in a bit. The second half of the talk will be devoted to roll vortices. Uh, we, the key resources I used in the work that I've been doing since I retired from AT&T is uh, the re resilient uh, mesonets, and not only the New Jersey one, but also the Delaware one. Delaware has one also. Uh, the 500-meter resolution weather research and forecasting model, which was run right after Sandy right after Sandy, and it was run to, um, uh, because Cray stole the new computer at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, and they wanted a big problem to test it on, so they ran it on, on, on Sandy, so we were lucky to have that. And then the NOAA radar data, is, uh, and the surface data, et cetera. So first, uh, you know, the first half of the talk will be on an overview of Sandy's landfall and uh, the rest, and the second half basically will be on uh, road vortices and presenting evidence of them. Uh, again, the high resolution surface observations from the New Jersey and the Delaware Mesonet. Uh, I mentioned this stuff already. Pete Johnson was the one that uh, ran the wharf simulation at NCSA, and. Uh, you know, a variety of partners on this work. Uh, this shows the coverage of the data that we used. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, a lot, many of you will recognize the different sites. The purple ones are the 
New Jersey mess on that. Um, and the Delaware Masonet and the Orange Triangles are profile observations. Um, the, uh, uh, the one in the middle there is the uh, Fort Dix radar, which uh, provides profile observation of the winds, which we'll be getting. I'll be showing some examples of later. And oh, the red line is the track of uh, Sandy. And this four circled observations are wind observations that I uh, studied in, in a bit more detail, which I'll be discussing later. Uh, the simulation was, as I mentioned, was the advanced research version of WERF. Uh, it was run on the machine known as Blue Waters. Like, as I said, it was a brand new machine at the National Center for Input Computing Applications at the University of Illinois. And this 500 meter grid spacing, I mean, that's pretty, uh, you know, pretty uh, high resolution for, you know, for a hurricane model. As a matter of fact, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, we had 5,000 by 5,000 grid points and 150 layers high over, you know, pretty much half the United States all the way up to the Mississippi River. So, um, I mean, 500 meters is, uh, I mean, you could walk that distance. You can walk between grid points in the model you know, in five minutes. Um, initialization and boundary conditions were the GFS output. It was run for 96 hours and it produced a lot of data. <laughs> this is part of the challenge, part of a good part of the time that I spent was on managing this data. 43 terabytes were data, trying to pare it down to a sizable amount of data for me to you know, crunch and work with. Okay, okay, Sandy overview for starting with the observations. This is the National Hurricane Center analysis at uh, 21Z on uh, landfall day. And it was three hours before landfall. And this was the time that the National Hurricane Center declared Sandy to have become extra tropical. That is, you know, I mean, you can see it with the fronts they drew in there, the National Hurricane Center did. It looks like a you know classic ex extratropical wave, uh, the, the warm front. The, the difference being though, <laughs> looks a little strange because it's rotated 90 degrees from the normal configuration. The warm front is pushing westward instead of uh, northward. The cold front is pushing, no pushing northward instead of eastward. Um, and the at, at this point in time, the, as you can see the warm sector associated with the storm, even before landfall, is enveloping the state of New Jersey. And we, we can actually see that in the Mesonet observations. Um, <coughs> these, are, these are the uh, temperatures uh, from the Mesonet. You can see the temperatures. This is the morning, early morning before landfall. The temperatures were in the low 50s. But as we progress through time... It's not cold, I remember. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to look at that. Um, as we progress through time here, wait. Come on. Oh, there we go. Maybe I have to look down here. Wait, that, it's well, not that's not updating. <laughs> it's updating on here, but not in there. That's interesting. Hmm. Maybe well, you gotta see that. Click on it and look. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Let me try. No, that's too bad. I won't, means I won't yeah, you want to see the change. The yeah. animations. What about in the middle, that, that triangle? Those little yeah. things on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. The, the one in the middle. Maybe yeah, I, well, I see it move here. <laughs> My screen's big there enough. It I'll there, no, it's, it's, it's going. going. There you oh, go. Now. Yeah, it was that little play button on the bottom. There you oh, go. Okay. Now it's moving. Okay. Yeah. Well, the temperature is warm, but I remember it got very Okay, cold. well, in, in, so in any case, uh, as you're, yeah, you, you saw the red area move across the state. Uh, yeah, I wish I could control, control it myself, though. Let me see if I can. There's a, yeah. Oh, okay, now I can. Okay. Uh, okay, so you can see this is, this is right before, uh, what time is it? This is like six hours before landfall, right? The warm air is entering the state. That's pretty much the uh, uh, the warm sector of the storm. But then the cold air follows it pretty quickly. 
um, as the storm center moves across southern New Jersey, there's a little patch of warm air that is associated with the center of the storm. Uh, and interestingly, you can see that the warm air is being brought in on north-northeasterly winds, uh, and the cold air is being brought in on uh, southeasterly winds, kind of the reverse of what m one might expect. <coughs> okay, hopefully that stopped. Okay, so um, okay, the, here's a view of the extratropical air streams. Um, this this is the uh, goes water vapor image of the of, of Sandy. This is uh, warm moist air, uh, uh, which is the warm conveyor belt. Uh, this is the cold conveyor belt, which looks quite a bit like this diagram. This diagram was is is a typical is a classic model of the airstream. This was not drawn from this, <laughs> but it sure looks like it was. I mean this shape. The shapes uh, exhibited by Sandy from the water vapor image certainly hmm. look exactly, you know, yeah. almost identical to what's drawn here. Uh, the de descending dry air stream is uh, this orange area here. We have three different uh, classic uh, air streams associated with an extratropical system that are exhibited there. Uh, let me see if. Okay, no, that worked. <laughs> Um, this is a zoomed out view of what we looked at before. Uh, is it going back? No. Right. For whatever, for whatever reason, this can't one control. Let me try hitting this. There you go. And then take it back. Okay, now I, can, okay. So I guess I have to hit that to control the <coughs> one here. Uh, okay, so you can see it, Sandy early on, it was about 15 hours before landfall, Sandy was still very symmetric, the storm was symmetric, then it, uh, as time went on, these are three hours apart, these, uh, these pictures, and eventually it loses its symmetry and becomes uh, very asymmetric as time goes on. This is after landfall. Do we know what the highest wind uh, that was recorded? The highest wind that we measured on the MesaNet was, uh, I think, Seeger, about 80, I forget the exact number of it, so 80 never some even, miles per hour. Never even hit 100. Uh, no, no, never, never hit 100, right? Yeah. Never, never hit 100. Uh, we, have some, we have some winds that I'll show from the, the radar, the Fort Dix radar, measured above the ground, which are 100 miles per hour above the ground. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, no, not at the surface. <coughs> okay, here's another view of the uh, warm sector traversal of the New Jersey Mesonet, except that the uh, the winds are indicated by streamlines, so you can get a get a better idea of the airflow. So you can see the red behind here, which is the warm air. The warm front is uh, right about here. You can visualize it pretty easily. And by this time, by an hour before landfall, the warm front had worked its way all the way to southern, uh, the southern border of, of New Jersey. I think that's Cape May there. Uh, we can, uh, I won't bother to animate this one since I've been having trouble coordinating with that. Okay, here, yeah, here's some measurements of the wind speeds at Fort Dick. Now, it's a, it's a height time uh, profile. This is seven hours before landfall on the left. This is two hours before landfall. And the colors indicate the wind speeds. 51 meters per second, just double uh, units of meters per second to get miles per hour, roughly corresponds. So the black, the black areas here are over 100 mile per hour winds centered at 1,500 meters above the ground. Uh, and we'll come to this later when I talk about row vortices, the importance of the winds uh, in, in Hurricane and Sandy are highest, not up at the jet stream level, but the highest winds in a hurricane are always down low. I mean, 1,500 meters is pretty, it's fairly low. 
Another thing you can see, the Doppler, since the Doppler radar, uh, you can't measure the winds with the Doppler radar unless you have precipitation droplets, precipitation particles. This also indicates the, uh, where the precipitation particles are in the vertical. So uh, right at this point in time, we have deep uh, precipitation, deep convection occurring over the, over the Fort Dix site. That's the intense convection associated with the, uh, with the warm front. But then the top of that, the top of those precipitation layers drops lower, lower, lower until we have a very, uh, only a very shallow area of precipitation near the ground, uh, you know, right around landfall time. And, and yeah, I got and very little rainfall out. out of sand. exactly right, and that's why because yeah. we weren't well, we weren't, we didn't really go through. You'll you'll see it when I show the radar. We didn't really go through. Uh, the intense rainfall associated with the warm frontal convection, most of our precipitation came from shallow layer. You'll, you'll see that when I show the radar here, uh, the radar imagery. Uh, now, okay, so far I showed data from observations. Now we're going to look at the model's representation of, uh, of the storm. What I'm showing here, we're looking, oh, New Jersey is under this tinny looking surface. Okay, uh, Cape uh, Delaware Bay is right about here. Uh, here's Long Island, Long Island Sound, just to get you oriented what you're looking at. But this surface represents the top of a moist air layer, and the colors indicate the height of the, of the top of that layer. So you can see there's a fairly deep cylinder of moisture right around the center, and this is uh, two hours before landfall. But there's a flat pancake layer of moisture over which envelops the state. And this is, and this represents the warm front here. So the moisture that's brought in is fairly shallow. The colors represent the temperature of the air near the near the ground and and the, and the water surface. Uh, so here we have cold air, we have cold air flowing over the ocean, being modified by the ocean surface, and wrapping around the storm center and be just beginning to enter New Jersey right here. The dry air is etching away this moist air. Um, let me uh, animate that. Uh, let's see, do I? Okay, good, I have control. Um, so before, early in the morning of landfall, there's a, there's a big, massive area of moisture, but as the, uh, as the storm gets closer and closer, this this area pancakes out, right? It gets flatter and flatter. So it gets lower and lower, while the moisture around the center uh, remains deep, although it shrinks in diameter. You just see how it's shrinking mm -hmm. there. Then you could see how this <coughs> how this dry air is just starting to etch away the moisture there, even before landfall. This is uh, this is three hours before landfall at this time. Uh, this is landfall time right here. That's landfall time. And you can see most of the moisture has already been etched away. Right. Yeah, yeah. But we have this cylinder right around the storm center. And that follows the uh, storm. Uh, now, okay, now, this, uh, this is not real here. What happens here is not real. I mean, this didn't happen in reality. As we know, the oh. storm center went Oh. Follow the southern border of Pennsylvania, just to the north of the border. So uh, the Wharf model uh, goes haywire here; it takes it down to Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> but so on the next slide, didn't I'll, it loop? Didn't it do a strange move? Uh, not, not no, no. well, not that I know of. Over land, I don't know much about what happened over land because we have you know, our power was I out. That was the one that I, did a strange. Move. I know yeah, it, it came up the coast and made a short well, enough turn. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it was so short, I, the thing I remember is it was forecast several days in advance. Well, and it seemed like really yeah. odd the, the movement right. that the storm was going to make, and it turned out to be the forecast was correct. Yeah. Right. The, was in fact, yeah. the the Euro, European model had the for, I think eight days in advance. They showed yeah. it making a left turn. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't ever remember in my lifetime. You know, a once a hurricane turn, curved toward the right. northeast, as opposed to it usually goes out. This is yeah, the first right. time that yeah. what I ever remember a hurricane taking a left turn, hitting yeah. New Jersey directly. Yeah. Uh, in, in 
my lifetime at least. But I'll show a comparison of the tracks here to show you how the work model goes haywire here. Here, the red is the actual track which we saw mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, here's Cape May there. The Wirth model does a pretty good job. The, uh, the landfall point is about 20 kilometers south of where it really happened. And it takes it across New Jersey, southern New Jersey, pretty well, but then it slows it down and takes, the, takes a left hook here <laughs> up the Chesapeake Bay for whatever reason. We really don't know why it did that, but uh, maybe someday we'll know. Okay, okay, here's an, another view. This is interesting because you could. Uh, let me just, the, the, here we're looking at the cold air. Before we're looking at a moisture surface, here we're looking at the cold air. This is the top of the cold air mass. Uh, this is, again, at three hours before landfall time. Uh, and by this time, you can see it entering, you know, entering the state of New Jersey, uh, the tip of it. But it's interesting um, when we watch the animation of this. Let's see, okay, yeah. The, the entire uh, eastern seaboard is enveloped in the cold air at this point, but then Sandy brings in the warm air. There's that warm sector covering New Jersey, but then three hours, three hours before landfall, it brings in the cold air into New Jersey, displacing the warm air. And remember we looked at the mesonet observations before? We saw that little patch of warm air in the Mesonet observations, traversing southern New Jersey, and and this this illustrates pretty vividly how why that happened. It's this cold air that strangled the circulation of Sandy, and uh, and and weakened it after landfall. But but that little core of warm air followed uh, followed the center of the storm across the state of New Jersey until it entered Pennsylvania. I didn't, say, I didn't say much about wind so far, but uh, this this is a aircraft-based surface wind analysis. We actually had reconnaissance observations that were the, well. The last one was made at landfall time, uh, and uh, th th this represents a wind speed, the best representation one can make of wind speed based on reconnaissance observations. Plus, the, the, the National Hurricane Center uses a lot of other observations, satellite observations, et cetera, to uh, produce their best depiction of, of the winds at the surface. The pink are the highest winds, the green are lower, lower wind speeds. Um, you know, it isn't, it, uh, it isn't cast in stone. I mean, it's not, it's not extremely reliable because it's based on aircraft observations, but you know, it should be a pretty good depiction of where the highest winds were. If, if that's the case, if, if this is a better representation of the winds, it means that the WERF model didn't do that well with high wind speeds over the northern New Jersey because the red and the pink areas represent high winds. Um, it, 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 it did pretty well in the southwestern quadrant of the storm. Uh, you can see high winds uh, uh, over and around the Delaware Bay, over and around the Chesapeake Bay, um, just as this, uh, the, uh, the aircraft-based observations show, but uh, not uh, over north of the storm center. Um, let me just show this. Uh, I mean, you, you can see that as time evolved, I'll just go back and forth with this. Uh, I mean, nowhere do, do, you, do we ever get really high wind speeds over uh, over northern, northern New Jersey. They're pretty much confined to over the ocean. A little bit uh, directly north of the storm center, but most of the higher winds are south of the storm center. So in that respect, the model didn't, uh, didn't rep the, represent the wind fields, uh, uh, their magnitude that that well, at least over northern New Jersey. Okay, now it's always nice to look at time series. Uh, this is just a sample of one. This one's south of Long Island. This one is uh, uh, over the western and central border of Delaware. And this is over uh, Cream Ridge. Uh, that's uh, e east southeast of Trenton, right over the waste of the uh, state of New Jersey. And uh, the models 
representation of the winds are the black, the black line, the green are the Messina observations. And these are, these are three days worth of observations, so landfall time is, uh, is right about right about there. Everyone. Landfall time is right about <coughs> is there. Uh, so you can see, for example, actually the the model did pretty well for this location and this location of the ocean, but didn't do so well. It represented the magnitude of the sustained winds uh, over this period of time, but uh, but kept them going for it started them much earlier and ended them a little a little later. Okay, so that was kind of an introduction to Sandy. Now we're going to talk about this uh, new feature, uh, roll, roll vortices. Um, first, a couple of concepts. I, I alluded to this earlier. Well, the boundary layer, and the boundary layer is the air layer that's most affected by the Earth's surface. So. Um, it's typically a kilometer, then two kilometers, it, it, but it varies, the thickness of it could vary depending on you know, time of the year, time of the day, uh, roughness of the underlying surface. Um, it depends on a lot of things, but it's typically, say, one kilometer, maybe two kilometers thick. Now, the, these are wind speed profiles that were measured at Fort Dix with the Doppler radar there. And uh, oh, oh, the other key point, I think I mentioned it earlier, the key point is that the hurricane winds peak near the top of the boundary layer, not up at the, where the jet stream level is, where the, air, where the commercial aircraft fly, but over a hurricane, they peak down low. Um, so if we look at these wind speed profiles, for, uh, we see that the highest winds occurred, as we saw in that previous plot, the highest wind speeds occur um, at about six hours before landfall, um, and they're about 50, uh, about 100 miles per, per hour over four ticks. So they were 100 miles per hour, but you know, at, at 1,500 meters above the ground. However, uh, if we look at landfall time, at landfall time, the winds dropped to uh, only 30, uh, 72 miles per hour. But look where they are. They, they're peaking down at 600, 600 meters. I mean, that's not that high. I mean, the Empire, the, the, the top of the needle on the Empire State Building is about, about right, right there. So it's not much. I mean, the peak winds during the storm are much higher than the Empire State Building, which is not, you know, not by atmosphere standards. That's not very high. Um, and this is important to understand role, uh, role vortices and, and, and the role they played in, in winds at the, at the ground layer. Okay, so what are role vortices? Well, they've been observed in 12 prior hurricanes, but mostly over open water. Since uh, there have been publications on them since 1998. <clears throat> um, uh, but so let's say this slab depicts the boundary layer. Say it for the sake of argument, it's a kilometer thick. Um, this arrow, this broad arrow here, yellowish, orangish looking arrow, represents those high speed winds at the top of the boundary layer, let's say. Okay, so if you have roll vortices, um, what's, what's happening is you, the winds are not just blowing like this. They're also doing this, and if they do, and if they're doing that, it means that between the rolls, the air is what is moving downward. The air is moving downward. If the air is moving downward, what can that do? Well, we know if, ever, if the air is moving downward, it kind of diminishes precipitation, right? It diminishes precipitation there, but it also can bring some of this high-speed wind at the top here down to the surface. So, th so this is the connection, be this, this is what we hypothesize is causing those patches of tree fall in, in that you have high speed winds along lines uh, caused by these roll vortices which cause trees to fall along uh, you know, in, in elongated patches and that's what I'll show some evidence of that later. But so in, where the rolls are 
circulating in this in this direction, the up, upward motion here, and therefore you, one would expect enhanced precipitation here and, and lighter winds. So you have these alternating lines of high, low winds, high winds, low winds. Okay. And it, uh, okay, the other complication is that the rolls not necessarily, you know, don't necessarily only do this, <laughs> they can also do this. You know, the wind is blowing this way mainly around the storm center, rotating like this within the boundary layer, but they could also move sideways. So if you have an anemometer on your house somewhere here, and these rolls traversed your house, what do you see? You're going to see winds that increase, and decrease, increase, and decrease. And this is exactly what I remember during Sandy when um, I was cowering at the top of my basement stairs waiting for something to crash on the roof, you know, so I could jump into the basement quickly to get out of the way. Um, I remember the, the wind, you know, the winds were high, but, you know, all the time. But then, then all of a sudden they pick up to, a, you know, a, the typical freight train, the freight train sound, really extremely high winds for, say, uh, 10 or 15 seconds or so. Then it would drop off again for 5 or 10 minutes and pick up again. And so, you know, n there's no way to prove it, but it sure seems like what was happening is that roll board and see that we're, you know, traversing the, uh, you know, my, my house. Um, okay, so, as I said, you would expect to see them, the, the such effects in time series. Um, the, the, these are the circled dots that I showed earlier, a Allentown, Teterboro, Trenton, and, uh, uh, the Mount, Mount Holly, the National Weather Service location. Uh, you, you'd certainly see fluctuations in these red curves here, which are the average speeds two-minute average speeds from ASOS stations. Um, uh, this bracket, for example, is showing t uh, 10 minutes between fluctuations. But the, the real way to do this, to do this mathematically, is to do an auto, what's called an autocorrelation analysis of these. And I show that on the next slide here. Um, what these show is the values are correlation coefficients. And what it shows that yeah, it's 10 minutes to the highest correlation in, you know, high, high wind speeds. And uh, the, these numbers correspond to the, to the other locations that of the, essentially the periods between uh, peaks and wind speed. And it's interesting, what's interesting is that, also interesting, well, it's interesting that it corresponds to, you know, my memory of the time periods, right? Five or ten minutes between peaks. But although I didn't record anything at the time, I was just worried about saving my life as opposed to, you know, taking weather observations. Um, uh, Allentown is farthest from the storm center. Remember the storm, it, well, if I were to draw it on here, the storm center is off, you know, off the coast there yet. Uh, Mount Holly has a short, uh, has a shorter time than Allentown, and uh, so if we assume that the roll, the rolls are all traveling with the same speed, it suggests that these are smaller roll vortices than the ones out here, further inland, and we'll we'll see evidence of that when I show the radar picture shortly. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here here is a radar uh, image. This is one and a half hours before landfall. Uh, let me point some features out here. I'll be hard to tell. There's, a couple. There's Cape May. There's uh, Raritan Bay here. Um, th this is that intense area, intense convection associated with the uh, with the intense warm front. This is that shallower precipitation uh, on that moist air that we saw on the Messonet observation, the warm, moist air that coming in, entering the state of New Jersey behind that warm front. And this even looks like, these wider uh, echoes look like the cold air that's beginning to, I mean, that we saw on the uh, 
the simulation. This looks like a cold air that's coming into the beginning to enter the state right there. So that you can see all the different frontal features that I showed earlier on this single radar image. Okay, the other thing I didn't point out is that these lines of green, blue, green, blue, green, blue, uh, they look like what one would expect, right? Lines of enhanced and diminished precipitation because of the rolled water seas. And as a matter of fact, you can see ones here, uh, lighter blues and alternating lighter blues and uh, darker blues. Uh, and indeed, if you measure the wavelength between these features, indeed, it looks like these are smaller than the ones out here, just you know, kind of as we anticipated from what I talked about earlier, the times, this time series of the wind measurements. Um, okay, let's, uh, if I animate this, hopefully it Okay, I guess I guess I guess it's loading and buffering here because I see it happening on my screen, and then later I see it happen on there. Maybe it needs to load up a buffer on on this. <clears throat> uh, but uh, let me back up here. Okay, yeah, that's what's happening. But okay, this is interesting. You can see here. Uh, you, you see the storm center still look, it looks symmetric, but look how fast. That symmetry gets blown away. It just goes from, over the course of one hour, it goes from a symmetric looking hurricane system to, to asymmetric, to a frontal system. It's that becomes the warm front. It goes from here, concentric circles, to a frontal system in like one hour. That's, I think that's pretty amazing. Um, and then you see all these lines of presumably the uh, row vortices behind this uh, warm front. And then you see the cold air coming in as the storm made landfall and after the storm made landfall. Okay, so now this is the, you know, the Doppler radar, so we should be able to see, can we see it on the, on the uh, velocity data from the radar? Um, this is uh, the radar uh, radial velocity. Uh, the thing about the uh, Doppler radar is that it only measures the flow of the precipitation droplets toward or away from the, uh, the radar. Uh, toward is green and away from it is, is red. But indeed, we see lines of, uh, of different shades of the color. But it, let me let me look at this. Okay. Yeah, I can move it. Um, indeed, you can see the lines. But let me let me stop it at one point here. Hopefully, I can stop. It. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, let me change it a bit. I guess, I guess that's good enough. But we can actually see changes in the colors. Uh, green, red. Green, red, green, red. So what does that mean? It means that the air is blowing in different directions relative to the radar. It is alternating between green and red. It's from and to, from and to, from and to the radar location. So it tells us something about the, the wind direction in these lines. So let's, um, we're going to zoom into this box to look at that more closely. This is, uh, the, the yellow line is the Delaware River, the red line is uh, Interstate 78, so we're looking over the Eastern Phillipsburg area there. Uh, we'll zoom into that. And the color scheme is a little bit different. The green is still there, but we have yellow instead of red. But we have, in the green areas, we have wind flowing towards the ra uh, The radar is off to the lower right there, the radar location, so and winds pointing in the direction of the radar in the green area, pointing away from the radar in the yellow area. So the, the air is converging on this line, the red line. So if the air is converging there, and if 
the elevation of the radar beam at this point is uh, 1,300 meters above the ground. Uh, so if the air is converging on this line, it must be going somewhere. It can't keep accumulating there. But where is it going? It's going downward, right? Exactly what we would expect from if roll vortices were occurring. We have the opposite situation at the blue line. The air is moving away from the radar in the yellow area and towards the radar in the green area. And the air is moving away from that blue line. Therefore, it must be coming from somewhere coming up there. So under uh, this red line, we expect uh, lighter precipitation and high winds at the ground under here. Here we'd expect heavier precipitation and lighter winds at the ground under that line. So we can, we can, we can t keep these same lines and arrows and put, instead of having the radial velocity, we can put the reflectivity image under there, and that's what I've done here. And indeed, we see under the red lines, we have lighter uh, precipitation. Under the blue lines, we have heavier precipitation, or near them. Um, I, you know, I can't show the surface winds at the ground for this, <coughs> using the radar, but it sure is suggestive that uh, these are indeed roll vortices that are occurring. Does the model see uh, the roll vortices? This is the models representation of vertical velocity at one kilometer above the ground three hours before landfall and what do, what do we and it was, the upward motion is shown in red downward motion is shown in blue and indeed we see these lines of red and blue and red and blue and red and blue alternating lines of upward and downward motion exactly like we would expect um, Yep. Well, we looked at, okay, so here. Uh, <coughs> well, it's not important. We're looking at, we're, uh, you can probably guess what's happening there. We're looking at the, how the appearance of the vertical velocity was as we scan through the volume of the, of the boundary layer. So uh, th th this is interesting. So was the roll vortex responsible for, like, when I looked at the trees and the evergreen trees by me, it seemed like, they, like you said there's like a roll. Well, I think it's just. Well, I it think wasn't it's, like a straight wind. We can you, the way they came down or appears to come down was that there had to be some more motion. So. Well, I mean, it it could be. I mean, it could be that, yeah. If like if you were directly, if this patch of trees was directly under uh, a roll of vortice, a roll. You know where the air is descending. Uh, as it, it descends, comes down, and then spreads out, you know, horizontally in the line. So, you know, I, I don't know exactly what your yeah. layout was. I'll show you my. I'll show you my layout. I had two blue spruces no, come down. It, it, it's it. clear that they all went in this, in you know, in one direction. I, along. Think, I believe there was a lot of rain the previous couple of weeks. The ground was saturated, yeah, yeah. and that made it easier for the trees. Yeah, to I've, pull I've talked to foresters about about that, but yeah, but it still doesn't explain the patchiness. Yeah, uh, right, it doesn't explain right. the patchiness of the yeah. trees. I, I talked to them about, um, you know, the type of soil and whatnot. But I mean, for me, it was, you know, my soil and terrain is much different from my neighbors too. You know, my neighbors, <laughs> but my trees fell. My, my neighbors suffered some trees that fell, but beyond the immediate neighbors, no trees <laughs> fell. <laughs> You're in bizarre. Bridgewater, New Jersey? Bridgewater, yeah, on top of the watch on Ridge, yeah. Oh, so what's your elevation? Uh, let's see, 100 meters, uh, 400 feet, 400 feet. Oh, 400. Uh, the valley is 100 feet. Uh, the, uh, we're at about, it, it's over 400. It's, it's about 300 feet difference between the mm. valley and, and right. us. <clears throat> uh, but this, this is uh, this is the uh, model view, a cross section of the model view. I need to orient you so you, you know what we're looking at in this cross section. Uh, I guess I can use my finger. Uh, so we're, we're looking at a vertical cross section through the center of Sandy, a north-south cross section, at land, roughly at landfall time. And we're looking westward towards Pennsylvania from a point 
uh, say, over the mouth of Raritan Bay. So, so here's the surface. Here's the Raritan Bay. Is the, mm. Its pink areas are wind down in a uh, downstream of the Raritan Bay, high winds, streaks down in the Raritan Bay. Here's the cross section. It goes from zero to four kilometers above the ground. And the arrows represent the flow in the cross section. And, and this is the model's representation of what's happening. It's an upward, the wind's going upward, downward, upward, downward. Mm. Uh, it's hard to see where the upward is. It looks like upward here, downward, mm. upward. Uh, I mean, we can see them right in. Now, now it, yeah, it doesn't have the ideal shape because there's a lot of stuff going on along this cross section. There's mountains up here. There's Water bodies, lakes maybe, uh, I don't know if lake, uh, 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 Spruce Run is in here or not, or rivers, or out in river, whatnot. It's in there, uh, you know, variations in uh, the cities, now New Brunswick might be under here, city versus fields that all can influence the airflow. Um, oh, another th interesting thing is that these red areas are the highest winds, and look where they are. They're right at about one, if this is four kilometers, right at about uh, one and a half kilometers, where we measured the highest winds to be, where, well, where the, um, the radar measured the highest, the Fort Dix radar measured the highest wind to be, right at about one, one and a half kilometers. Uh, so you know, everything make, makes sense. Okay, so. But it's hard to see. I mean, you could see you could see where, under these upward moving air motions, we have light winds here at the surface. That's what this blue area is. Yeah, where the winds are coming down, you have uh, some yellows in here where we have higher winds at the surface. And you know, you can follow that along under these upward and downward motions. But it's hard to see because, of, like I said, because of all the terrain features that are different and. The roughness at the surface are influence the winds at the ground. So what I did <coughs> was I, uh, I spatially smoothed the wind speed and subtracted that spatially smoothed wind speed from the raw wind speed. This yields a wind speed deviation from the local mean. So what essentially what it means is that the red areas are extra high winds and the blue areas are extra low winds. I, I call the red areas footprints of, you know, high of uh, footprints of the uh, of the roll vortices, high speed footprints of the roll vortices. Uh, and when, indeed, in this rectangle that I drew here, we have alternating lines of, of blue and red and blue and red. So I mean, if if this were reality, uh, I mean, this is the model, but one might expect this to. to to have caused maybe some tree blow down areas under under the red areas uh, where the winds were high. Uh, <clears throat> so, in in this, I drew true rec true rectangles here because, okay, so you can see that in, in this rectangle we would expect to have a, a lot more higher winds and lower winds, right, than this area. There's a lot of green. The green is you know, more or less average winds, not nothing extreme happening. There are a lot more high winds and low winds in this rectangle compared to this rectangle. So what I did, I, I produced a histogram, uh, two histograms, one of this area and one of this area. And that's on the next chart here. Uh, the percentage of data points versus wind speeds. The red one is the roll for the roll region. The blue one is for the region without rolls. And what we see, it, we could use this to estimate the wind hazard, the extra wind hazard because of rolls. I mean, you can see that we have much, you know, higher occurrence of low wind speeds for the roll region and the higher occurrence of high wind speeds. And we could, if you could look at the numbers, if you could blow that up and actually look at the numbers, you could, for example, if we took 28 meters per second uh, as a number to look at, uh, 56 miles per hour, we would find, if we looked at these numbers, there's 25 times more likely to experience those winds where the, in the roll region than the non-roll region. So this means, for example, if it takes 56 mile per hour winds to blow down and uproot an evergreen tree or an oak tree or whatever, you know, for the sake of argument. Um, it's 
25 times more likely for it to happen if roles are present than, than if roles are not mm -hmm. present. <clears throat> okay, here's uh, the view of the, I talked about this wavelengths earlier, um, these different uh, patches of, uh, of lines represent the different clusters of, of roles that were observed in the radar. Uh, the diamonds represent the different clusters of roles measured by the the, the model, and uh, so you can see, and this goes from nine hours before landfall to six hours after landfall. So it just gives an idea of how the wavelengths varied, or the range of the wavelengths, and how the model compared to the observations in terms of the size of the roles. It shows that the model, for example, was a little bit uh, smaller on, on, on this roles that it simulated than, than occurred in real life. It also indicates that they occurred over quite a large span of time before and after landfall. Uh, what's not shown on here is that the roles that we measured for Sandy are lot. Yeah, I remember I, I mentioned those 12 pre previous storms that were studied since 1998. The size that we saw for Sandy were larger than any previously observed. So that's, that's one of our key results. Um, okay, K uh, Kung Gao, um, he, he uh, I think I mentioned earlier, but he's, he's been studying roll vortices for five years now. He has his own model just for roll vortices. And, and you know, just looking at the left side here, forget the other ones. Um, yeah, his, ro from just his roll model, he shows <coughs> This is a cross section, vertical versus horizontal, of the size and shape of the vertical velocities. And this is our WERF model's representation. What is and the red and the blue? Right? Oh, the red and upward and uh, upward motion. So which one's up. upwards? Uh, yeah. Red is upward, blue is yeah. blue is downward, right? <clears throat> so the, the the point is they you know this this model was totally dedicated to representing roles. This has a lot of other stuff in it. It's much more complicated, but it sure shows a lot of the features that he was able to exhibit in his uh, in his role model. Amazing okay, we're you can coming. We're coming to the uh, <laughs> coming to the end here. Okay, here's my pro here's my property in Bridgewater. This is before before and after pictures. This, just the top one. This is another piece of property. Um, this was. This was 11 months after Sandy, so a lot of cleanup was done here. And it's hard to tell where the, that this, this whole area here is totally free of trees. There were trees that blew down. That's behind your house? Here, behind my house, right. The back of the ridge of the, the steep ridge of the Electro Mountain, <coughs> right, right about here on the edge of the picture. And you can see there's some tree fall here, some tree fall over here. Uh, but it, it expanded. It, extended from here to here and all the almost all the trees were Did you have any home damage? Anything, I'm sorry? Anything to your house? No. I don't mean trees falling on it, I mean just out because all the trees in the front of the house blew away from the house and, and the only thing that fell in the front of the house is an evergreen tree that was fifty feet away from the house and it was fifty feet tall. So it didn't yeah, yeah, yeah. we I mean we lucked out. Um, okay this is just another similar uh, yeah. Uh, location in Somerset, New Jersey, and just in case you don't believe that all trees fell in the same direction, <laughs> there, that's the west southwest there. Yeah, <laughs> point look at that. Pointing to the west west southwest. <clears throat> Must have got a lot of firewood out of that. Uh, I we did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did, yes. Um, okay, so in summary. I'm going to summarize here, and then if you, I have a few pictures, my own personal diary, but it won't take another minute. Sure, that's this, fine. But, uh, We're, okay. sure. We're good. We, we hang out sometimes till 9 o'clock, okay. so it's no rush. Okay, there's no rush. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the data that we use is the radar data, wind speed observations, the WORF simulation, the specialized Kung Gao, specialized roll vortex model, and so key findings were the Observations exhibit many characteristics that would expect of roles. The WERF simulation and the roll vortex model corroborate many aspects of the observations, as you saw. 
therefore we can confirm that, that we indeed had roadworms seized during Sandy's landfall. Um, and it's the first time that road water seas this large are recorded in a landfalling hurricane. So, but, but, <laughs> these, these are the tough ones, and we haven't answered these yet. Can it be shown that the trefoil patches were indeed caused by a road water seas? I mean, everything pointing to that, but, you know, it's pretty hard to make that link. And why were they so large? <laughs> we're going to try to figure that out. Okay, so uh, this is my little 14-picture diary of Sandy's landfall. Oh, no, right. there. Uh, uh, October 27th, leading up to the storm, the outer fringes. Uh, it look like, sure look like Mamatis clouds. Yeah. Yeah. October 28th, <coughs> on I-287 somewhere. Uh, this is the first picture I, the second picture I took after venturing out in the storm. This is the evergreen tree that's on our property. So, tree. what is the theory about why it affected the evergreen trees so much? Well, well, but, these are the only, well, these are the only three evergreen trees that have affected. Uh, you know, there's one here and it's just off the camera. Right, but, but the, all the, the others the were roots No, that shallow. I know. Yeah, that but, well, but it, well, it just I, seems the way the yeah, winds well, moved said that shallow, it changed. Shallow rooted, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the ground was super saturated, mm -hmm. and the roots are shallow. So, uh, that, well, that I know, but I thought maybe it's it's the wind. Well, the well, way okay, the wind yeah, you actually. Notice there aren't many leaves left on the trees, so the evergreen trees create a you know a little bit more, a yeah, a little more resistance. They have the pines catch the wind and the spruce uh, uh, right. the needles. Yeah. They, they catch the wind That's more true. than the That's defoliated uh, trees. Uh, so, yeah. It's, it's, it's a complicated, I, you know, the, the foresters do this, the forester researchers do this for a living. And they, I mean, it's amazing what they model. They model, the, you know, the size of the tree, the, the, the density of the branches, the, where the leaf canopy, canopy is. They can, you know, they to, to determine the wind loading on the tree and, and, you know, where the canopy is and, you know, the physics of the tree falling and, uh, you know, the root. They model all this stuff, so you can get answers to your question if, yeah, yeah, if you look hard enough. <laughs> it was just one hell of a storm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay, so when I was, remember I said I was cowering in my at the threshold of my basement, ready to jump down into the basement at the first sound of something hitting the roof. Every once in a while, in low winds, I would get my flashlight out. Remember, it was dark at this time. Get my flashlight out and look around. See what's going on? I saw this. Thing there that I couldn't figure out what it was. What is this thing that I never saw there before? This giant boulder or whatever. Where did that come? Hmm. It took me about a minute to realize this was the, you know, the bottom of a root ball, oh. of a tree that mm -hmm. fell. And the trees did not all fall at once because every time I went out during a wind lull, not outside, but out, <laughs> outside of the basement with my flashlight, I saw another root ball down. They, I mean, it seems like yeah. during every, in each of these high-speed episodes, of How much land do you have? Fell. I'm sorry? How much land do you have? Uh, one acre, a little over one an acre, acre, acre and a quarter. But then you backed up to the mountain and Yeah, the yeah, right, the ridge is yeah. right. maybe in another picture. Which is all preserved ridge. land, I'm assuming. The thing you can see from here is my next-door neighbor is much more articulate set of <clears> painting of his trees <throat> than, than I am. Uh, yeah, this is his property. He lost a few tree, and uh, next neighbor over lost some also. But beyond that, no, absolutely no trees fell. <laughs> My neighbor on this side lost a few trees, two or three, but that's about it. We lost thirteen in all. Electric like placement. I'm sorry. Electric placement. Oh, thank you. I'll tell my wife. <laughs> oh, you saw this one. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the oh, side, wow. the side view, looking towards. Uh, and that's your property. Yeah, this is wow. my property. Yeah. That's How much cool. did it cost to have all that? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. Did I'll insurance show, cover? I'll show a picture later, but not to be working. But I, you know, uh, while our power was out, from I, we led a farmer's life. I mean, in the morning <laughs> at daybreak, we were outside. I was outside. <clears throat> cutting these things up as best I could, but we did hire somebody later, the Rich Tree Service, to take all the pieces away. Um, I, I don't know, maybe five or six thousand, I forgot. At least. Insurance cover anything? 
no. 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 Because it didn't damage our house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> didn't damage yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Darn. True. <laughs> no. I don't. <clears throat> I, um, Is there a chance for it? And you know the guys who took the trees away, they just chop it up and sell it as firewood. Yes. Well, I so felt, they make, they make prompt well, on both ends, you know. Yeah, 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 exactly. But I felt so bad about cutting. I tr what I, I tried to get somebody, I tried, my brother-in-law who, who lives in Pennsylvania, I mean, this was beautiful that's wood. A, that's a big tree. Beautiful so. wood. I, I, I was just sad for me to cut it up. But I could, with, all, with all the trees that were down across the state, yeah. Everybody was too busy doing you other things. Cut it up and you pile it up. my trees, okay. yeah, taking my lumber. Season. Then you I, I, it was just so sad to cut these. Yeah. This yeah. beautiful lumber. Have like you re have red, replanted red oaks and white there, oaks? I'm have sorry. You, have you replanted any trees in the same spot? Ah, uh, actually, it's funny you should mention that. Only, only this past week did we have oh. <laughs> the, actually the next door neighbor, who is a landscaper, plant three evergreen trees here to. Uh, but that's all. We didn't plant anything else in the backyard except three evergreen trees. <clears throat> uh, okay, all of them were uprooted except this one. This one was snapped off. Yeah. Snapped right off. Oh, and here, here you can see. Here's the rid uh, ridge. This is where the it drops. Goes off. down. Yeah. yeah, it drops off right there. This yeah. is the western horizon yeah, I can see beyond. That. Um, and it's interesting. The one that snapped off was the one closest to the ridge to the ridge line. Hmm. Um, Oh, oh! This is my draft, my sketch. Here's, this is the western edge of the Watch on the Ridge. It's the front house there. But here's here's the tree that snapped off, the, the largest diameter tree. And I measured the circumference and then calculated the diameter. Twenty nine inches wide. It was the largest uprooted tree, twenty nine inches diameter, and the closest one to the house that fell was. The one that I showed the picture of the kitchen window and placemats was uh, 25 feet. 25 what feet kind of trees were they? Were they oak? Were they white hickory? Oak, mostly white oak, red oak, and I think that I think one maple. But hmm. I, I did check the different kinds of trees as, after this. Yeah, mostly white oak, some red oak, and I think one one maple. Oh, and the one blue spruce in the front. That one was on. Oh, the other interesting thing was. I measured, I only measured three trees very carefully, you know, I measured them from where you would measure from the top of the trunk to the very top of the tree canopy as best I could. Everyone measured 82 feet. I mean, all three of them measured exactly 82 feet. Oh, you mean in total? Yeah, the height of the tree, yeah, 82 feet high. When they were each, upright. Each tree was 82 feet 80, high? 82 feet high. Every, all three trees were, 80, well, were that's, 82 feet that's high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not 81 feet or 83 yeah. feet. 82 feet. <laughs> wow. Interesting. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Halloween, the uh, trick or treaters didn't come, but the birds got their, <laughs> their treat. Uh, and you saw you could actually walk in the where the trunk tree trunks fell, but where the tree canopy fell, I mean you couldn't even walk. You had, to, you know, you had to pretend you were in a jungle to climb over. This you must have heard stuff. a lot of things coming down hard, right? It, well, no, that's another thing. You didn't because the wind, the, the wind, sound it of the wind, I didn't, it I didn't, and I didn't hear anything thud. I presume because. Yeah. You know, the trees, you know, because the canopy of leaves and whatnot, they just mm. kind of fell. Maybe they fell slowly. I, I mean, know. that's a lot of trees. Yeah. 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 And so, so in the 10 days while all our power was out, this is, I spent time sawing up all this stuff. Yeah. So at least I could walk. Back. I was out for a week. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, oh, yeah. So if our, by, before November 2nd, our uh, daughter and son-in-law, Came with this from the state of Delaware, uh, bearing gifts of uh, <laughs> gasoline cans and <laughs> portable generator. So we lived in the confines of our bedroom for, for you know, a few days with, uh, with at least we have heat, heat and light. And notice the star ledgers here. This is November second. There are three copies of the star ledger there. They didn't stop them. I think maybe for one or two days. I think it held up the presses there, but they, they still deliver them and. This didn't do much, much good. I, get, I, I can't figure out what I was doing with the computer and maybe loading these pictures onto it because there's no cell phone service, no, 
No power. Is the power at the yeah at the library? Um. Yep. It was. We did not lose power here at the. Oh library. really? Okay. Uh -huh. Um. Remember that huge East Coast blackout? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. In two thousand. Yeah. Uh huh. Three, Four, three, three thousand yeah. in August, right? Was in August. No, yeah, it was over the August. summer. Mm -hmm. We didn't lose power here either. Oh, like, wow. <laughs> I remember I had just started working here, and everybody's saying, "Oh, everything's out, everything's this out." Is, uh, but during San, but right after Sandy, we were a warming space and a charging place. We uh, opened. Uh, okay. okay. We stayed yeah, open yeah. late. We there opened up days. Of, we weren't yeah, we normally were open. We were a charging spot for the We had hundreds of people in here. I mean, I only yeah. lost power for two days, mm -hmm. so mine days. wasn't too bad. But I think my most of the town was, mm -hmm. was out for the whole week. Right. Yeah. Most of the town was a week to ten Pretty days. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I remember um, seven. There was a little bit of cleanup going on. Looks like this guy lost his windshield because of a branch that fell on him. I guess. Well, went by me. I and then remember it. this. Uh, yeah. Still, yeah. Right here, yeah. the storm. Yeah. And you can see the big. This used to be a forest. <laughs> what the one we had last year? Big hole. This no, is last year. No, that was after Sandy. This was Sandy. This was Sandy. It snowed right after. Right after Sandy. Yeah. yeah. This is November eighth. <clears throat> yeah. I remember the October big snowstorm we had that time. I had yeah, yeah, this inches, is right after Sandy. Hmm. Yeah, I know it was cold. This is my last yeah. picture. We had our power back by then, but two, we were out 10 days, but by November 8th, two blocks away from our house, they were still without power. I think these, this neighborhood, this block, this area got their power back. I think the most I heard of with anywhere near us was two weeks, so they were out of power. For two weeks. So that's uh, that's that's it. That's folks. Sandy. Well, thank you very much. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, is that something your the roll vortices that when future hurricanes may be making landfall that you would look at that data or send somebody down or to collect that data, like plan well, to do that ahead of time? Well, yeah, that it could lead to that. I mean, another thing this could lead to is incorporating the impact of the road vortices in modeling, you know, in hurricane models. That's, mm -hmm. I guess that's the, that's the primary area that we're looking for. I mean, the winds, I mean, you, you saw how, how well the WORF model reproduced detail on the <coughs> surface of the variations in wind speed. It's because I mean, it's unbelievable what's in models today. Uh, you know, uh, like you know, where you have corn where you have fields versus uh, uh, marshland versus where you have uh, you know, suburban areas versus uh, uh, you know larger buildings. All that is in the model. You know, area little area by little area, uh, uh, grid point by grid point, and in, our, and in this model, every 500 meters. So. Uh, and and uh, the wind, the, one can calculate or estimate what the winds are at the surface based on all that data. And depending on how accurately you represent what's happening in that boundary layer, um, you know, you can better represent the wind. So if you, if you can include the effects of overall vortices in the model, what we know about world vortices now, and prove, you, you know, maybe someday we might actually be, be able to represent uh, yeah, the, the patchiness. I'm just the wondering, did, did anybody ever keep records of, <clears throat> like after hurricanes or whatever? I don't know how the hell they would do it. How many trees came down or the volume of yeah. tree, you know, yeah. some kind of volume? I, I think the power companies, <coughs> you know, do it to a certain extent because of the tree fall effects there. Yeah. You know, there. <coughs> You know, they might do it on a sample basis and then apply it to, you know, entire larger areas. Curious, you yeah, know, when yeah. you compare hurricanes, like, yeah, that was one yeah. as opposed to And, and uh, individual research projects have done that, the way back to Hurricane Andrew, I think the first one that comes to mind, you know, they saw little swaths, they saw fine-scale patterns in the in the tree fall, and there they were related to, not to roll vortices, not to these types of vortices, but these types of yeah. vortices, you it know. It was like a tornado. Kind of like 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 larger than tornadoes, but smaller than the storm type circulating features. <clears throat> the, these seem so. to be features that you can you can identify after the fact, mm -hmm. but they'd be almost impossible to predict. Yeah. You know where they where right yeah happen. yeah right yeah 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 right because it's you know it's. Chaos. It's, yeah, you, you, need a, you need a net like every five feet. You know, right, right, right. Point, you know, right, right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. But, but again, yeah, it would be impossible to predict exactly, in a, in, even if you would incorporate the effect of rural vortices in the model, I mean, the most you could expect, you couldn't expect to predict exactly where the high winds are and the low winds, but what you could predict is that rural vortices will occur, and if they do occur, you would expect higher winds, right? Like I showed in the one diagram of the history, of the history of the time, which illustrate that the, you know, the winds will be higher because you have rural vortices. Now, but this is kind of interesting because most people, you don't visualize rural vortices during a storm. This right. is a new way of looking at winds. Yeah, yeah. Well, you think of the winds just going in one direction. Right, exactly, straight. right, yeah. You yeah. don't think of them... You know, it's a lot more complicated. Right. It's well, they, yeah, yeah, yeah it's the lot. winds do move around, right, actually. Yeah. But, you but you don't, yeah. You know. go out. I mean, I'd never heard of rural vortices until I started doing this work two, <laughs> two years ago. When I started seeing these lines in the, you know, in the, in the radar and whatnot, and, you know, something unusual was going on here, and I started reading, reading up on it. It's, uh, it's only a couple of years ago that I uh, uncovered, I mentioned, uh, you know, Kung Dao has been studying them for, Five years, but uh, yeah, last year, you know, the, the thing with science, you know, any kind of science today and any kind of research is that there's so much and so much specialization that's happening that, you know, I never ever thought that I'd be studying roll vortices. <laughs> <laughs> I know whoever, I mean, whoever heard of roll vortices. Well, you're retired, so it's a good time to do it. This tiny area. I'm sorry? <laughs> Since you're retired, it's a good yeah, time right. to do it, right? <laughs> so you're counting on some real severe storms so you can get more data. Yeah, right. yeah, well, uh, <laughs> more <laughs> destruction. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's put it this way. If they happen, I'll lose the data. I'm just like, <laughs> well, you're not I'm keeping your fingers it. crossed. Well, if it I'm happens. Let, I must say, going back to what I said about, you know, we're, it's the first time in my life I, mean, I would always, I would always, seek out severe weather, uh, you know, in Man, terms of scary. want to experience it. This, Sandy, was the first time in my life that I worried for my life because well, of severe weather. It's very, you know. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm afraid of uh, high winds. I have it in my weather records. I can't remember when it was. Mm -hmm. September, oh, maybe, God, it's got to be. 20 years ago or something, mm -hmm. um, I got a straight line wind mm -hmm. that came up, came across, hit a big tree, uh -huh. and landed on top of my one of my peaks oh, on the right yeah, roof. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Luckily, it was pretty yeah. strong. It came mm -hmm. through with a squall line. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. right, yeah, yeah. splash, and yeah. boom, it came down, yeah, and yeah. then it rolled over. And what was nice in the neighborhood where I am, people came out with chainsaws yeah, and yeah, stuff right, yeah. and uh -huh. helped out. And I right. went on top and I put yeah. on a tarp to cover until yeah. right. I got somebody up there. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty scary. I tell yeah. you, when in the summer with the thunderstorms, mm -hmm. I worry about that. Because yeah, well, my trees are a little too close to the yeah, house. Yeah. I got to get some trimming done. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's scary. I don't want the wind. Right, right. Well, that's how I, I, that's how I am now. You know, wintertime blizzard scary, winds now it's it's basically scary. okay. The leaves are all mm -hmm. down. Right, right. It's exactly. a different type of wind. Right, but, right. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, squall yeah. lines with thunderstorms, right. scary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I yeah. find it. Yeah, it changed my view. <laughs> after Sandy, of course, I took my camera and I was wandering mm -hmm. around. Right. Um, and I, I noticed very quickly that there was... Of course, I was looking for damage. Mm -hmm. But that's I have my camera, you know. Right. And at first, I was disappointed because I left my house and it's like there were a couple of branches. You know? Yeah. And, I, and I'm hearing in the news, you know, that there's a, and it's like you know, God, you know, and I, and I went a couple blocks it. and I noticed one tree, you know, yeah, falling yeah. down. And now I'm stuck. And then I a couple more blocks and then there were two trees. And all of a sudden, I, I was getting into New Milford down there in the, the, the tree. And I quickly noticed there were some people didn't mind if you took pictures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, one guy actually invited me in his backyard to see a really big tree that had fallen. <laughs> but there were some people got upset. And mm -hmm. after a while, I realized it's because like you're one of those rubberneckers. Mm -hmm. You know, their mm -hmm. property's mm -hmm. damaged, and right. here's this bastard mm -hmm. coming to take mm -hmm. pictures. Mm -hmm. You know, for you know, see, so I quickly learned you had to, you sort of had to be yeah, careful. Yeah, you know, you. Yeah. So in, in your endeavors like that, did, so did you find evidence of this patchiness where where we do, you would you know go on or drive on for, well, for like, miles like and I then say, see nothing, not, but then all of a sudden right. you see a lot of it. In Bergenfield, where, where I live near the high school, there really wasn't anything. 
Mm. And like I said, I, I, I couldn't, the power, was, we lost power for just a couple hours. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Right. The whole time? In, in New Milford, on River Road, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they lost it for days. Mm -hmm. But I, around our house, like I said, I was really very disappointed because, mm -hmm. you know, I was following the storm in the news. Mm -hmm. Half a mile from my house is where mm -hmm. I started seeing damage. You know, mm -hmm. you know damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it, but anyways, it was an exciting storm. I could, took a lot of pictures, mm -hmm. you know, and... and uh, uh, the thing that I remember the most about that storm was a week ahead of time, mm -hmm. I forget where it was, actual weather or whatever, but they were showing the plot of the storm, and all of a sudden it, it makes this left. Right, right, yeah. And I was thinking, this yeah. is not no way. There's something yeah. wrong with the right. model. Yeah. And it turned out it was exactly right. 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 Yeah. Bill Evans, I was listening, oh, he actually had a class at Bergen Community College. Mm -hmm. And the class was the Monday before the storm, so it was a week before the storm, it was... He showed us the radar, mm -hmm. and he goes, you see this storm? New Jersey's in trouble. <laughs> and sure, I mean, he, he had the, the, the GFS model, right? Mm -hmm. Or the, Europe, the European model. And mm -hmm. sure, the storm, the storm was forming over, our, over Cuba. And then it just yeah, came up and... Yeah, I, I, I found it hard to believe also it's that. Crazy. So why... Yeah, I was in that class. Really? Left left really? Mm -hmm. Why Except, did it turn left? What was there was a blocking yeah, high yeah. over Greenland, yeah, right? Yeah, right, yeah. And yeah. that was that yeah, pushing it. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Push that. Plus, the coming in from the west, which undercut it and pulled yeah. in the upper part of the trough. Pulled that, it. Yeah, that the yeah. trough yeah. pulled yeah. it, and the, yeah. right. the yeah. high yeah. pulled it. High, yeah. And it hit just at the right time, high tide. Yeah, yeah. 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 all of that. And, and when, you look at the, yeah. when you look at the geography of the New York City Bay Area, it's like a funnel. Right, right, exactly. You know, Long Island, and everything got pushed. Yeah, into the, all that the work up constrained the area, crazy. you know. In, in, in a way, it was like the perfect storm. Yeah, right? everything was just it right. Was line, yeah. The timing lined up, uh, yeah, everything yeah. was lined, lined up to make, uh, have it happen. But I remember the, the Weather Channel, like a year or two before that, said, New York City is due for big hurricane. Remember seeing that? They, they had different shows on there. Sure enough, mm -hmm. you know, they because they said, they said mm -hmm. New York City mm -hmm. was never really hit by a hurricane. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, you sort can't, and you sort of can't really call that a hurricane because it wasn't a hurricane. Well, right. yeah, yeah, that right. didn't get yeah. it. Yeah. 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 It was a, but of course, there was a drop. We were walking up here yeah. because yeah. all the rain. Uh, yeah. Looking out to the south. Very little right. rain. Right. 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 So surprised. Yeah, South Jersey, you know, Cape May County, they got they got a ton of rain. Well, I mean, you saw what happened there. I mean, it to that radar image, it was. Very symmetric. All yeah. of a sudden, yes. <laughs> all the convection went <laughs> off to the south within an hour. Yeah. Just and, and and we got if I never see another rain, hurricane, yeah. I'm happy. More trees would have come out. I don't really want mm -hmm. to see it. <clears throat> Yeah, we, we hike a lot up at, at the Palisades in the State Park. Oh, yeah, I used to when I lived in Florida. And you all kinds of trees, mm. you know, mm. like yeah. all in the same direction, mm -hmm. you know, tree up there. Oh, yeah, around Rockaway, boy, mm -hmm. there's lots of woods and hills and everything. Unbelievable mm -hmm. on the trees. There's so much firewood that's still laying in the woods, mm -hmm. <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. We'll never yeah, see right. a storm like that again. Yeah. Yeah. Never say not. never. Uh, yeah, never say never. <laughs> never and always. Never is a long time. <laughs> there's, there's a great YouTube video of when the Con Edison power plant blew up in Manhattan. There was, there was a security camera somewhere on, in one own city, like facing Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden... I mean, the entire... It, 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 Lit up. Yeah, it, it was like a bomb went off. Mm -hmm. You know, for two or three seconds, an enormous flash. Mm -hmm. My And my uh, my uh, in-laws, they live in Canarsie, in Long Island, and it, 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 uh, in New York City, you know, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, because when the storm started, there's a fishing pier in Canarsie, and uh, uh, two of them went out there, and they were taking pictures of the waves. Ah. And it was, like, very exciting, yeah, you sure. know? And... Uh, you know, the waves crashing and everything like that. Well, they lived about a quarter of a mile, more than that, more than, almost half a mile from, you know, the, the water. They went back home, and then one of them looked out the window and realized there was water in the street, you know? And then about half an hour later, water was pouring into their oh, basement. Yeah. Uh, and, it, you know, it, it went from, let's go and take some pictures. To, yeah, to yeah, we got to save our life. Yeah, yeah. yeah to how the hell there's water in the street. Yeah. And they, they lost their car. And then there was yeah, this yeah. mad dash of people were trying to drive their cars to a little higher ground. Right. And there wasn't enough space. Yeah. You know, it, That's terrible. It, 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 it was amazing how far inland 
Mm. You know, the flood right. waters reached right, in, right, in right, Lower yeah. Brooklyn. Yeah, surprise. Well, their elevation is what? Three feet yeah, above sea level? Yeah, yeah surprise. That's so why I keep surprise. saying go north and higher elevation. Yeah. <laughs>